This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. Notes from the Underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky Part 1, Chapter 3 With people who know how to revenge themselves, and to stand up for themselves in general, how is it done? Why, when they are possessed, let us suppose, by the feeling of revenge, then, for the time there is nothing else but that feeling left in their whole being. Such a gentleman simply dashes straight for his object, like an infuriated bull with its horns down, and nothing but a wall will stop him. By the way, facing the wall, such gentlemen, that is, the direct persons and men of action, are genuinely nonplussed. For them, a wall is not an evasion, as for us people who think and consequently do nothing. It is not an excuse for turning aside, an excuse for which we are always very glad, though we scarcely believe in it ourselves as a rule. No, they are nonplussed in all sincerity. The wall has for them something tranquilizing, morally soothing, final, maybe even something mysterious, but of the wall later. Well, such a direct person I regard as the real normal man, as his tender mother nature wished to see him when she graciously brought him into being on the earth. I envy such a man till I am green in the face. He is stupid. I am not disputing that. But perhaps the normal man should be stupid. How do you know? Perhaps it is very beautiful, in fact. And I am the more persuaded of that suspicion, if one can call it so, by the fact that if you take, for instance, the antithesis of the normal man, that is, the man of acute consciousness, who has come, of course, not out of the lap of nature, but out of a retort. This is almost mysticism, gentlemen, but I suspect this, too. This retort-made man is sometimes so nonplussed in the presence of his antithesis that with all his exaggerated consciousness, he genuinely thinks of himself as a mouse and not a man. It may be an acutely conscious mouse, yet it is a mouse, while the other is a man, and therefore, etc., etc. And the worst of it is, he himself, his very own self, looks on himself as a mouse. No one asks him to do so, and that is an important point. Now, let us look at this mouse in action. Let us suppose, for instance, that it feels insulted too, and it almost always does feel insulted, and wants to revenge itself too. There may even be a greater accumulation of spite in it than in L'homme de la nature et de la verité. The base and nasty desire to vent that spite on its assailant rankles perhaps even more nastily in it than in L'homme de la nature et de la verte. For through his innate stupidity, the latter looks upon his revenge as justice, pure and simple, while in consequence of his acute consciousness, the mouse does not believe in the justice of it. To come at last to the deed itself, to the very act of revenge. Apart from the one fundamental nastiness, the luckless mouse succeeds in creating around it so many other nastinesses in the form of doubts and questions, adds to the one question so many unsettled questions, that there inevitably works up around it a sort of fatal brew, a stinking mess, made up of its doubts, emotions, and of the contempt spat upon it by the direct men of action who stand solemnly about it as judges and arbitrators, laughing at it till their healthy sides ache. Of course, the only thing left for it is to dismiss all that with a wave of its paw and, with a smile of assumed contempt in which it does not even itself believe, creep ignominiously into its mouse hole. There, in its nasty, stinking, underground home, our insulated, crushed, and ridiculed mouse promptly becomes absorbed in cold, malignant, and above all, everlasting spite. For forty years together, it will remember its injury down to the smallest, most ignominious details, and every time will add, of itself, details still more ignominious, spitefully teasing and tormenting itself with its own imagination. It will itself be ashamed of its imaginings, but yet it will recall it all. It will go over and over every detail. It will invent unheard of things against itself, pretending that those things might happen and will forgive nothing. Maybe it will begin to revenge itself too, but as it were, piecemeal, 
in trivial ways, from behind the stove, incognito, without believing either in its own right to vengeance or in the success of its revenge, knowing that from all its efforts at revenge, it will suffer a hundred times more than he on whom it revenges itself, while he, I dare say, will not even scratch himself. On its deathbed, it will recall it all over again, with interest accumulated over all the years and... But it is just in that cold, abominable, half-despair, half-belief, in that conscious burying oneself alive for grief in the underworld for forty years, in that acutely recognized and yet partly doubtful hopelessness of one's position, in that hell of unsatisfied desires turned inward, in that fever of oscillations, of resolutions determined forever and repented of again a minute later, that the savor of that strange enjoyment of which I have spoken lies. It is so subtle, so difficult of analysis, that persons who are a little limited, or even simply persons of strong nerves, will not understand a single atom of it. Possibly, you will add on your own account with a grin, people will not understand it either who have never received a slap in the face. And in that way, you will politely hint to me that I too perhaps have had the experience of a slap in the face in my life, and so I speak as one who knows. I bet that you are thinking that. But set your minds at rest, gentlemen. I have not received a slap in the face, though it is absolutely a matter of indifference to me what you may think about it. Possibly, I even regret, myself, that I have given so few slaps in the face during my life. But enough. Not another word on that subject of such extreme interest to you. I will continue calmly concerning persons with strong nerves who do not understand a certain refinement of enjoyment. Though in certain circumstances these gentlemen bellow their loudest like bulls, though this, let us suppose, does them the greatest credit, yet, as I have said already, confronted with the impossible, they subside at once. The impossible means the stone wall. What stone wall? Why, of course, the laws of nature, the deductions of natural science, mathematics. As soon as they prove to you, for instance, that you are descended from a monkey, then it is in no use scowling, except it for a fact. When they prove to you that in reality one drop of your own fat must be dearer to you than a hundred thousand of your fellow creatures, and that this conclusion is the final solution of all so-called virtues and duties, and all such prejudices and fancies, then you have just to accept it. There is no help for it, for twice two is a law of mathematics. Just try refuting it. Upon my word, they will shout at you. It is no use protesting. It is a case of twice two makes four. Nature does not ask your permission. She has nothing to do with your wishes. And whether you like her laws or dislike them, you are bound to accept her as she is, and consequently all her conclusions. A wall, you see, is a wall, and so on, and so on. Merciful heavens! But what do I care for the laws of nature and arithmetic, when, for some reason, I dislike those laws and the fact that twice two makes four? Of course, I cannot break through the wall by battering my head against it if I really have not the strength to knock it down. But I am not going to be reconciled to it simply because it is a stone wall and I have not the strength. As though such a stone wall really were a consolation, and really did contain some word of conciliation, simply because it is as true as twice two makes four. Oh, absurdity of absurdities! How much better is it to understand it all, to recognize it all, all the impossibilities and the stone wall? Not to be reconciled to one of those impossibilities and stone walls, if it disgusts you to be reconciled to it. By the way of the most inevitable, logical combinations to reach the most revolting conclusions on the everlasting theme, that even for the stone wall you are yourself somehow to blame, though again it is as clear as day you are not to blame in the least, and therefore grinding your teeth in silent impotence to sink into luxurious inertia, brooding on the fact that there is no one even for you to feel vindictive against, that you have not, and perhaps never will have, an object for your spite, that it is a sleight of hand, a bit of juggling, a card sharper's trick, that it is simply a mess, no knowing what and no knowing who, but in spite of all these uncertainties and jugglings, still there is an ache in you, and the more you do not know, the worse the ache. End Part 1, Chapter 3